Well, there's trouble on the California-Oregon border. A few weeks ago, the American Civil Liberties Union helped file a lawsuit against Siskiyou County Sheriff's Office for racial profiling and harassment, mainly during traffic stops. The unrest was triggered by an officer-involved shooting at a traffic checkpoint last summer. Now, I don't know what really happened in this particular situation, but these kinds of controversies have been part of the American story for the past 50 years. However, you may be surprised by the identity of the aggrieved party in this lawsuit. It is the Asian American community of Siskiyou County. Racial tension looks a bit different in the Pacific Northwest, doesn't it? But the California-Oregon border has always been a hotbed of discontent. The rugged locals have had a long history of brandishing their fiery independence, especially with their soft uprising in 1941, which at the time could have rendered every map of the United States obsolete. This is the wild story of the free state of Jefferson as we lead into our passage today. Both California and Oregon were granted statehood in the 1850s. The border between the two territories had been drawn rather arbitrarily on the 42nd parallel, but the folks in this region never really identified with Sacramento or Salem. You see, when Midwesterners like us think about California, we conjure up images of suntan surfers and the Beach Boys, but California is vastly diverse. And outside of the Bay Area, Northern California is remarkably rugged and rural. To make a gross overgeneralization, it's the land of the God-fearing, gun-loving Americans whose value differ from those in the big cities of Southern California. And since the population on the California-Oregon border are underrepresented in both state governments, they loathe and despise any perceived bureaucratic meddling into their lives, which has led to several secession attempts over the years from those two states. But their most formidable bid for independent statehood came in 1941, and it was driven by a charismatic small-town Oregon mayor named Gilbert Gable. A Philadelphia native, Mayor Gable was no stranger to the spotlight. He had been a radio host for years, and he could work a publicity stunt with the best of them. He was an expert at drawing public attention to any problem, and a huge problem for folks on both sides of the border was a lack of state funding for their crumbling infrastructure. If their respective states weren't going to use their tax money to fix their roads, then why participate? So Mayor Gable collaborated with a like-minded Superior Court judge from Northern California named John Childs to convince the border counties on both sides of the line to secede from both the Golden State and the Beaver State to form their own. The proposed state would have become, at the time, the 49th in the Union. As a serious and respected public official, John Childs brought some much-needed gravitas to the movement, and he convinced other counties to jump on board, including the aforementioned Siskiyou County, home of the Siskiyou Daily News in Wairika, California, whose editor worked tirelessly to fan the flames of succession. The paper held a contest to name the proposed state, and after some ridiculous names that, of course, people recommended, folks eventually settled upon the designation of Jefferson, with Wairika as its providential capital. And it fit. Thomas Jefferson, of course, was a staunch defender of state rights. Shortly thereafter, a reporter from the San Francisco Chronicle named Stanton Delaplan took interest in the story, and he wrote a series of sympathetic articles about the succession movement. He drew national attention to the story and would go on to win the Pulitzer Prize for his reporting. Beyond that, Randolph Collier, who was a state senator from Wairika, added his support. He's the longest serving legislator in California state history, and so this thing was getting real. At one point, seven counties announced their intention to secede and form the free state of Jefferson. They adopted a green state flag featuring a gold mining pan inscribed with two X's. The X's stood for how Sacramento and Salem had repeatedly double-crossed the residents of Jefferson. Nothing like forming a state on spite. <laughs> then on November 27th, the citizens of Jefferson formed a pseudo-militia and passed out flyers to drivers on Highway 99, which aired their grievances. 
and they would continue seceding every Thursday until further notice. As a provisional governor of Jefferson, Mayor Gable proposed that the new state would be free from state taxes, liquor taxes, and income taxes. So it wasn't clear on how the state would generate revenue to fix the roads. But then tragedy struck. On December 2nd, 1941, Gilbert Gable died of a massive heart attack. It was a huge blow to the movement. Two days later, Judge John Childs was elected as Jefferson's new provisional governor. But as any student of history can tell you, the nation became preoccupied with more pressing matters on December 7th of that year. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, Jefferson's bid for statehood didn't seem so important. Judge Childs essentially shut down the project as the nation went to war. As an interesting side note, if Jefferson had become the 49th state in 1941, it would have had the distinction of being the only mainland state in the Union to be directly attacked during World War II. In 1942, Imperial Navy pilot Nubuo Fujita slipped through the American defenses and firebombed the region. Thankfully, the forest fire for which the Japanese military had hoped for never materialized, but many years later, Fujita returned to offer the locals his family's 400-year-old katana as an apology. In a truly heartwarming gesture of forgiveness, the population warmly welcomed Fujita and even made him an honorary citizen. Such a kind gesture would have gone a long way in legitimizing Jefferson statehood, but it wasn't meant to be. Today, anti-government sentiment persists in the region. As recently as 2013, there was another serious push for independence from even more counties in Northern California that would have resurrected Jefferson as the 51st state in the Union. The Sacramento will probably never let go. Too many natural resources come from that part of the state. Besides, allowing Jefferson to secede would be a de facto admittance of failure on the part of state government. But that doesn't keep the residents from dreaming. Signs can still be found in Northern California, indicating that the spirit of Jefferson is alive and well in the hearts of its would-be citizens. America is a weird place, and I mean that in the most endearing way possible. We are all so different. What other country has such a diverse population? Just take a walk down the street on the south side of Des Moines. Obviously, we are very diverse racially, but that's not the only area. We are also diverse socioeconomically. This neighborhood is not as wealthy as most, but you don't have to walk far to find some large and beautiful houses on the south side. Walk a little further and you'll find yourself in a rural culture with its own set of values. There's never been a nation as diverse as America. Oh, I take that back. There was one culture that could rival America in diversity, and that was the Roman Empire of Jesus' day. Rome had a political policy of inclusion. The empire worked tirelessly to keep the peace among the different cultures who fell victim to their conquests. You could keep your old cultural identity as long as you paid your taxes and didn't revolt. So the Roman Empire was a kaleidoscope of different ethnicities and civilizations. The Jews, on the other hand, in that culture were the opposite. They didn't want anything to do with the other cultures in the region, and they didn't mix with the Gentiles. So if you wanted to become a Jew, then you needed to go all the way. You had to change your diet, your religion, your philosophy, and most drastically, get circumcised. So the Romans let everyone in. While the Jews, they let no one in unless you changed and became like them. The Romans were assorted while the Jews were similar. But then you had Jesus. Jesus was a Jew living in a Roman province. Yet Jesus did diversity differently than everyone else. He didn't endorse the Jewish culture over the Gentile cultures. He didn't demand rigorous assimilation into Jewish culture, nor did he surrender his Jewishness. The Christians weren't artificially diverse, nor were they all the same. Instead, Jesus took some sheep from the Jewish fold, he took some sheep from the different Gentile folds, and he made them into something completely different. He took some malcontents from one state and some troublemakers from another state and made a brand new state. Hey, maybe the people of Jefferson were onto something. 
In today's passage, the Good Shepherd made a point about cultural diversity that seemed quite absurd to his original audience. His paradigm shift required a leap of faith that most couldn't take. Nonetheless, he called on his sheep to make that leap. For that was the only way to enter the life-giving abundance of God's pasture. And so it's time to stop pretending. Diversity is not some box to check on an application. It's not some phony virtue that needs to be artificially signaled on social media. True diversity, Jesus diversity, is already baked into the cake of Christianity. And if the church needs to work harder at being more diverse, then maybe we've already missed the point. So I'm going to encourage you to turn your Bibles to John 10, verses 1 through 21. If you don't have a Bible, you're welcome to take out one of ours from the shelf under the pew in front of you. Turn that Bible to page 896, and you will find John 10. Or you can use your smartphone to scan the QR code on the worksheet in the bulletin. It will take you straight to John chapter 10. As we've been talking about this summer, there's been a lot of random topics that I've been wanting to get to in our times together, but just haven't been able to. And so we've made an entire series on those random topics. We've been talking about everything under the sun this summer. But ironically, there are no topics in America today more divisive than diversity, tolerance, equity, or inclusion. These words are loaded with all sorts of cultural connotations. And Jesus' culture was struggling with this idea of diversity as well. But what Jesus called his audience to do in this passage was so controversial and countercultural that most of them couldn't even comprehend what he was talking about. They thought he was at best crazy and at worst demon-possessed. But folks, the Jesus life always requires a leap of faith from his sheep of faith. And the sheep who made that leap are never the same. Let's look at John chapter 10, starting in verse 1. Jesus is talking, and he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by, name, by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I come that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He was a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have another sheep, other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, so there will be one flock, one shepherd." For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, he is a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, these are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Now, to understand this passage, we need to know exactly to whom Jesus was talking, and clearly he was talking to the Jews, which in this case probably referred to the Jewish religious establishment rather than the common man. But their culture was very different from ours. They lived in a time when racism was completely normal. In fact, I'm not sure if they had a word for racism. For them, it was just okay to dislike other cultures. It was expected. Accordingly, the rich didn't even try to hide their disdain for the poor, and vice versa. 
But as usual, Jesus blew up universally accepted axioms with provocative parables. So let's break down these two little parables that Jesus used to confront the Jewish religious establishment. In the first one, Jesus conjures up the image of a sheep pen. And this would have been very familiar, a very familiar analogy for Jesus' Jewish audience. They knew from the Old Testament exactly what this metaphor stood for. Micah 2.12, the prophet says, I will gather the remnant of Israel. I will set them together like sheep in a fold, like a, like a flock in its pasture. And this was just one of dozens of comparisons between the nation of Israel and a sheepfold. So Jesus was clearly talking about Jewish culture and religion. There would have been no doubt about this in the minds of Jesus' audience. But then things got weird. Jesus started questioning the so-called shepherds in the Jewish religious establishment who had been confidently proclaiming themselves as God's representative to the culture. Maybe the Jewish leadership wasn't speaking for God, Jesus was implying. Maybe their disdain for the Gentile nations and cultures wasn't how God felt about the Gentile nations and cultures. And that would have been disturbing enough. But then the crazy talk really got going. In Jesus' parable, the good shepherd called his sheep out of this sheep pen to lead them somewhere else. Jesus was calling his people out of Israel. What? And these people would still be Jewish, mind you. They were still descendants of Abraham, of course, but Jesus was calling them out of the Jewish religion, the Jewish culture, and the Jewish way of seeing the world. Wait, what's wrong with being Jewish? Was Jesus racist? No, Jesus was a Jew, and there's nothing wrong with that, of course. But Jesus seemed to be saying that there was an identity that transcended being Jewish. And most people in his audience, as mentioned in verse 5, had absolutely no idea what he was talking about. To them, they were saved by virtue of their Jewishness. To them, they were right with God because they had been born into the nation of Israel. So they separated themselves from all the other nations by meticulously following their eccentric religious laws and dietary restrictions. Their Jewishness meant everything to them. In their minds, their identification as children of Abraham meant that they would be included in all the promises that God had made to Abraham and his descendants. But now, Jesus, this wild Jewish rabbi, was telling them to step out of this culture? He might as well have told them to step out of their skin. He might as well have told them to stop being human. It was absurd. How could he say something like that? Well, the Apostle Paul clarified this point later in the New Testament. In Romans 9, he wrote, For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. Just because you're born into some family doesn't mean you are in God's family. That makes sense, right? Why should that matter? After all, no one has any control over where they're born. But Jesus assured everyone that God's children weren't of any particular race, Instead, God's children were made up of everyone who believed in him. Jesus said in John 6, 40, Everyone who looks on the Son looks upon me, he said, and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. You are saved, forgiven, and receive eternal life through faith in the crucified and risen Christ rather than your own works or heritage or any other superficial means. So Jesus was calling his Jewish audience out of the culture and all the religious baggage that had been weighing them down for centuries because of the misapplication of the Old Testament by these uh, so-called shepherds in the religious establishment. Apostle Peter affirmed this message to the Jews immediately after the resurrection. In Acts 2.40, he said, And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation of this crooked religious establishment, in other words. He was calling them out of their old culture and into the freedom and abundant life that comes from a real relationship with God, not through religious laws and cultural identification, but through faith in him. It's hard to come up with a direct analogy to understand how difficult this would have been for them if we were them. For us, maybe it'd be like if Jesus told us to stop being Christians. You know, come out of that Christian culture and heritage and come into something real. You're a Jesus person now. That's, that's the best analogy I can come for to how crazy this would have sounded to them. 
They couldn't grasp what he was saying. The leap of faith was just too far. So they asked for a clarification. Surely Jesus meant something besides what he said, but he did not. Ref- he just absolutely refused to back down. In fact, Jesus took it a step further. Lest they thought that this new culture would be an even more exclusive subset of Judaism, Jesus started talking about sheep from another pen who would also be invited to join. Remember the analogy? Their sheep pen was Israel. So the other sheep pen must have been the godless Gentile cultures that they had been trying to keep out for centuries. These sheep would have no connection to Abraham through heritage or ancestry or even culture. Instead, they would be sheep of faith. Jesus was calling people out of every culture in the world to believe in him and create a new culture that was completely different from anything anyone had ever seen. They would become one sheepfold, one shepherd. They would be one people with one God. And everyone lost their ever-loving minds at that. He has a demon. He's insane. By the way, do you know how to tell when someone's lost an argument? They're reduced to name-calling and shouting accusations. So in the parlance of our opening illustration, Jesus had sheep in California, and he had sheep in Oregon. He wasn't calling the Californians to be Oregonians, nor was he calling the Oregonians to be Californians. He wasn't even trying to mix the best of both cultures together. He wasn't calling them to be Caligorians or Oriforians. He was calling people out of California and out of Oregon to become something completely new. They were to be Jeffersonians. They may not have been officially recognized as such by the established governments of California or Oregon, but they were Jeffersonians by faith. They would be the sheep who had taken the leap. And that's our main point from today's passage. It's in your bulletin. If you'd like to write it down, the main point is Jesus won't defend cultures or even blend them. He'll upend cultures and even transcend them. Jesus doesn't defend or promote one culture over another, even his own. He doesn't even try to blend them together. He upends them. He transcends them. Jesus never lost his Jewishness. He spoke the language. He celebrated the holidays. He looked Jewish. He had Jewish friends and family. Yet he never felt the need to endorse or defend his culture as the only way to live. He never tried to make anyone else Jewish, nor did he say that other cultures were the way to go instead. He didn't try to blend the cultures together, nor did he try to keep them apart. There wasn't Judaism light or Gentile-flavored Judaism. This was something different he was doing. Jesus upended the whole thing. He transcended every culture. And it was unlike anything the world had ever seen. Look at what happened when the Apostle Paul took the Jesus message to Thessalonica, which was a salad bowl of different Gentile and Jewish cultures. Acts 17, it says this, And some of the Jews were persuaded, and they joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women. But the Jewish religious leaders were jealous, And taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob. They set the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. The Jesus people had completely upended culture and turned the world upside down. Jews weren't identifying themselves primarily as Jewish anymore in the church. Gentiles weren't keeping their distance from the Jews anymore. It was cats and dogs living together, mass hysteria. In the name of unity, the Jews were willing to eat pork with their new Gentile brothers. And some of the Gentiles, like Timothy, were willing to get circumcised if necessary to make the Jews more comfortable. Can you imagine? And in this weird new Jesus culture, women had leadership roles. I mean, these people were first century woke, man. 
Christians were racially diverse, yet their race meant nothing. Religious rules and cultural norms and national loyalties were severely discounted. Everything centered around their faith in this new king, Jesus Christ, and they were bound only by his law of love. This was the Jesus life, truly. But the mob here in Thessalonica made a very nuanced observation. And mobs rarely make nuanced observations, so we really need to pay attention. They specifically accused the Jesus culture of pronouncing Jesus as king over Caesar. They indicted the Jesus people of proclaiming that the Son of God was greater than the son of the so-called Roman gods. And do you know what the Jesus people said in response? Darn straight. Jesus, you see, had pulled off the miracle that Caesar could not. The Roman Empire had been trying to assimilate all these different cultures under one barrier. And he'd do it by force if necessary. So his kingdom was more diverse than any the world had ever seen. But it wasn't working. Not really. These different cultures may have been Romanized in name, but they still held primarily to their old identities. And eventually, of course, Rome would crumble. But the first century Christian gatherings must have been amazing to behold. All the different races and ages and social classes were not just tolerating each other. Man, they were family. They looked different. Maybe they ate weird food and spoke various languages. But they were Jesus people first and foremost. No one was guilted into conformity. No one was shamed for being of a different race. And no one was bothered by their differences. Really, they almost had nothing in common. But they had Jesus. And they were bound by faith in him, expressing itself through love. As Paul observed in Galatians 5, 6, and this verse may have just been sounded so ridiculous in the first century, but he wrote, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. They believed in Jesus. They acted like Jesus. And that was enough to hold this brand new culture together. So they had accomplished, which had always been eluded, elusive uh, for Caesar. They didn't say, hey, come join us or else. They said, hey, let's all join Jesus. And their kingdom was bound together by genuine love for their king. In him they had abundant life. And while the Roman culture faded away centuries ago, the Jesus culture still stands. So here we are in America, and America is just as diverse as Rome ever was. You don't have to work very, walk very far on the south side to find other cultures. We have African Americans, Hispanic Americans, Asian Americans, white Americans, rich and poor Americans, old and young Americans, and everything in between. We're all right here in the same neighborhood, and we're really trying to get along. We really try hard to coexist in this big sheep pen here. We appreciate our cultural differences, and we may even assimilate those differences into our own culture, and that's good. But have you ever gotten the feeling that there's something better to aspire to than contrived tolerance, forced acceptance, phony shame-based surface-level unity? Then it's time for all God's sheep to take that leap. And that's our application from today's passage. It's in your bulletin again if you want to write it down. The application is, you can tolerate culture, which is fine. Or you can recreate culture, which is divine. The world is really trying to do the right thing. And it is, so, it, it, it is really good. You know, they're condemning racism, thankfully. And promoting tolerance and, and fostering inclusiveness and celebrating diversity. Of course, some nefarious factions have hijacked the process to promote their own evil agendas. There will always be anarchists and, and corporations that seize upon social movements to gain an advantage. But most normal people don't want to live in a state of constant tension. Uh, 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 most regular people, they want to do right by other people. 
They want everyone to be treated fairly, and typically these people really enjoy the nuances of our nation's cultural diversity. Whenever there are Asian American festivals or Mexican heritage celebrations, you know, all the rest of us show up to enjoy them. You know, America is awesome in that way. But like the Romans, we are trying as the world to accomplish Jesus' goal of unity without Jesus. That's what today's virtue signaling, political correctness, and so-called wokeness are all about. Most, f f most folks want America to be a place where everyone is loved and, ex and, and respected and appreciated and in the club, so to speak. And again, I'm not talking about those pulling the strings behind the curtain and pushing their agendas. I'm just talking about regular folks in America. These folks are they're promoting diversity, and, and that's wonderful. But do you get the feeling that it's not quite working? It's the right idea, but it's not quite working. And that's because diversity alone is not substantial enough to hitch your wagon to. There needs to be something more because diversity just for the virtue of diversity isn't enough. So while their promotion of diversity, the, the world's promotion of diversity and tolerance may be well intended, it's kind of empty. People need more than just ideals to keep them warm at night. And I think we are all instinctively, we recognize the hollowness in today's popular notion of cultural diversity. You know, we're diverse, but so what? You know, diversity alone isn't a virtue. It's just a way of counting people. We're tolerant, but is that enough? I mean, tolerance alone isn't really a virtue depending on what you're tolerating. Besides, can we aim higher than just tolerating one another? It seems like tolerance is kind of the lowest standard to which Christians should aspire. So it doesn't take a prophet to foresee that the whole crusade will eventually implode. There's just nothing real there. And then comes the church. And the church is always the last one to the party, isn't it? And the church usually takes one of two reactionary positions. We either hang our heads and succumb to this cultural push for artificial diversity, apologizing all the way and looking pathetic, or we start a culture war. We either dig in or we're dragged in. But the Jesus way is different. Jesus didn't elevate one culture over another, not even his own. And Jesus never reacted to cultural movements, usually for or against. Jesus created the cultural movements. Jesus was in front, not behind, reacting. And Jesus understood that you can't have real uni unity and tolerance and equity without love. Jesus' love sometimes caused him to say things that hurt. Sometimes Jesus' love caused him to take unpopular positions. But he realized that tolerance and diversity are not the end all. The end all is love. The goal is not to see people all the same or to emphasize their differences. The goal is to see them through the eyes of love. So rather than taking sides, the church needs to get out in front. The church needs to call out people from all sides to join a recreated and transcendent culture. The world needs to be reacting to us. And we rally around Jesus rather than some whimsical idea of equality. Look at what Paul said in Colossians 3.11. Again, this would have been absolutely ridiculous to anyone in the first century. He wrote, here, in other words, in the Jesus culture, the church, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. And I'm telling you, no serious person can honestly reject the Jesus culture. The Jesus culture is diversity by definition. It's diversity not through shame and manipulation. It's diversity through love. And if we need to figure out ways to be more diverse, then we've probably already lost. So the church must do what America is failing to do. Companies and institutions like to crow about how hard they're working at diversity, but it's all a show. 
They're just checking off boxes. The church, on the other hand, is working hard to be like Jesus. That's never a show. And the more they're acting and they're being like Jesus, the more diverse they'll become. Diversity isn't the goal of the Jesus culture. It's the byproduct. And in the end, when Jesus returns and recreates this world in love and, and he perfects it, then diversity will just be how it, there won't even be a word fight for diversity. It'll just be how it is. Look at Revelation 7, 9, in the very end. John says in his vision, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and people in all languages, standing before the throne. So I guess what I'm saying is that we need to stop trying to accomplish Jesus' goals in the world's way. The world tries to force diversity and then hopes that mutual love will be the byproduct. And it hasn't worked. Where's all the love we've been promised? But we start with love, understanding that diversity will always be the result if Jesus is truly proclaimed. Because love works in every culture. And and people always respond to Jesus. That's a culture they'll want to join because the unity is real and not surface level and contrived. At this church, we're not interested in asking people to join the Christian subculture of America with its own brand of music and movies and politics and dialect and clothing and slogans and patriotism. We are recruiting a culture that promotes Jesus and Jesus above all. And I'm convinced that Jesus is enough for real diversity. I want to close our message on diversity today with a story about Hall of Fame outfielder Jim Rice, who's kind of becoming a hero of mine. Jim Rice grew up in segregated South Carolina. His father transferred him out of his all-black high school to an all-white one to help his baseball career. And it was tough for Jim, but in 1971, he was drafted 15th overall by the Boston Red Sox. He was the only African-American player on the Red Sox for most of his 16-year career. Can you believe that? And during this time, Boston was in the throes of of racial uh, disharmony, and and they they were doing the the forced desegregated busing, and some people liked that, other people didn't. I mean, it, it was really a difficult time. Jim Rice, however, just kept playing baseball, earned the respect of players and fans alike. But there was one moment in his career that transcended baseball or race or anything else. It happened on August 7, 1982, in Fenway Park against the Chicago White Sox. Boston's David Stapleton lined a foul ball into the stands behind the home team's dugout. And a moment later, a four-year-old boy named Jonathan Keene was slumped over in his seat. His head was covered in blood, and he was unconscious. Can you imagine? Fans were frantically calling out for medical attention, looking around. But who knows how long it would have taken to get paramedics all the way down to the front row. It was one of those moments, you ever been in it, where just no one knows what to do? But almost immediately, according to newspaper reports, Jim Rice jumped into the stands, took the boy in his arms, and rushed him to the Red Sox team doctor. And moments later, Jonathan Keene was in an ambulance and on his way to the hospital while Jim Rice finished the game in his bloodstained uniform. When someone like stops the game, they get things done a lot faster. The boy was in critical condition for a few days, but ultimately, thankfully, made a full recovery. Doctors credited Jim Rice's decisive actions with saving the boy's life. You see, every second counts when brain swelling needs to be relieved and not what was going on, and they got him taken care of. Later, when Jim was asked by reporters about his heroics, he brushed them off with a simple question. If it was your kid, what would you do? So Jim Rice never stopped being black, and Jonathan Keene never stopped being white. And there was still racial tension all over Boston that wasn't going away anytime soon. But of all the white guys in the dugout that day, Jim Rice was the one who saw his own son in that boy. He transcended 
the, the controversy over busing and politics, he transcended the culture wars and saw Jonathan Keene through the eyes of love, through the eyes of a father. That's the Jesus culture. So there are no Californians or Oregonians in the church. Jesus transcends all cultural labels. So go ahead and, and tolerate different cultures. Celebrate different cultures. That's wonderful. But let's take it a step further. Jesus is in the business of recreating culture and transcending it. And so are we. Speaking of things that our culture gets wrong, next week we're going to talk about sex. But it's not just our American culture that gets it wrong, which we can forgive. The church culture has completely messed it up, which is unpardonable, right? We have the word of God. So the subject matter, matter for next week may be a little more sensitive than usual, especially for little ears. But it's going to be more about attitude than mechanics. You know me. We're not going to get offensive with this, okay? But God is not shy about this topic, as we're going to see from Song of Solomon 1 next week. And so we can't be shy about it either, and we need to think correctly. I can understand the American culture messing it up. They do that with everything. But we got to get it right. And so we're going to see what Jesus has to say about it. So let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this, this day. And God, I thank you for this beautiful, wonderful neighborhood that we live in. We are a microcosm of the diversity in this country. And we're thankful to be here on the south side of Des Moines. And Lord, I, I suppose we could try to contrive ways to be diverse or whatever. But Lord, we desire to love this neighborhood first and let the diversity flow from that love. I pray, God, that more and more as we are becoming like you, that our congregation would look more like the neighborhood, not just with racial diversity, but socioeconomic diversity and family structure diversity, age diversity. That this, would, this little church would be a microcosm of the diversity that is going to be expressed at the end of time. Not because of some sort of manipulation, but through genuine love and a genuine display of Jesus' culture. Thank you, Jesus, that you love us all the same. That the person over in the Middle East who is poor and persecuted is the same as the rich people here in this country, that you love them. How exciting is it that everyone is the same before your eyes because you love them. I pray that we could love them just the way you do. Thank you, Jesus, for this day. Encourage us as we go out and spend time in this beautiful culture on the south side. And I pray, Lord, that we would transcend it here with something even greater. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.